right. Uh, so today we'll be talking about Far From Heaven. Um, the director's con- Tom Haynes. Um, and Todd. What? Todd. Todd. I'm so sorry. Oh my no, goodness. Cool. Todd Haynes. Um, and released in 2002. Um, yeah. I mean, we have plenty to go over today. So would anyone want to kick us off? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, this this film was definitely like I didn't think it was going to be so clear cut of a of a melodrama because it was more modern, but it like followed almost every rule. It um it did not stray away from its genre even a little bit. I thought there there might be some added something, but it was very very melodramatic, uh, which was kind of interesting. I think it also I know we didn't discuss this beforehand, but it used some of the same techniques I think as as an older melodrama would from the 50s. Like, it, what jumps out to me most is the um, scene when she's driving in the car and it's such an obvious green, sc- green screen behind her. I've seen dozens of movies from the 50s uh, where they have the exact, it looks like the same amount of realness. It's the same everything. It, it was really weird to see in like a newer movie or film. Can I say something up quickly about that? So it's, it's actually not a green screen, it's true rear projection. So in, in a green screen, there's a green screen obviously behind the car and they key into that color of green and replace everything that's green with another image, usually digitally. But what's going on in this film is it's like there's a screen behind the car and then behind the screen, there's a projector projecting an image of the road disappearing behind her on the screen and it's somehow synced up so that the camera on this side and the camera on that side are in sync so they don't strobe or anything and that's how they were that's how they did it in the past and i'm certain that's how they did it here because he was very much trying to use old technology to sort of reduplicate the look of um a 50s melodrama and so even down to you i read that they used incandescent lights instead of halogen lights to give it that old 50s look and there's no other way to achieve that than to use old technology Anyway, yeah, just didn't want to reason. interrupt, but yeah. No, so I just want to piggyback on what you said. That's actually that same technique is how they're filming the Mandalorian, the Disney Plus series. They're using the exact same technique. They're not using green screens. We're not using as many green screens. Wow. They have like a 360 stage where they're projecting. But yeah. That's shocking. <laughs> like that's really yeah. hard to believe. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I also um I've I noticed like a couple other shots. Um the train specifically you know there's this you know the train's taking off goodbye and then there's the uh the mirror shot that stood out to me when uh kathy's doing her makeup and frank is sitting in the back uh kind of in you know almost silhouette if i remember correctly and he's like you know moping and there's that over the shoulder mirror shot um which i have seen in a few 50s films um but yeah, uh, it's definitely, you know, shot the shots very similar to old 50s. Yeah. Do you think the melodrama at any point became hilariously overdone? Or was it done in a way that, because um, I mean, when we looked at like the Joan Crawford clip, like you could, you could watch that and you could be emotionally moved by it or you could kind of almost laugh out loud at how over the top it is but did this film ever reach the point where you just thought oh my gosh this is like unhinged or does it pull back I I don't know it's it's tough to place in that way um I think one scene that stood out to me is when um Dennis Quaid like hits his wife and then he's like I'm so sorry and then she's like just get me some ice I'm fine the whole the whole thing was so melodramatic where they start like kissing and then it's like incredibly intense and then he's like i can't do this i can't do this and then he like hits her and then he's like i'm so sorry she's like it's okay it's just the whole thing i was like this seems so so scripted (laughs) yeah like it's like it's not natural at all i wouldn't expect this to happen in real life because it wouldn't so in that sense it was very melodramatic and so that scene specifically stood out to me i don't know if anybody else had different scenes that stood out to them yeah, I think also when she was going up to Mr. Deacon or Raymond and, and she just, or she like, um, like she accidentally walked in on him, I guess, in her backyard and she just start, started sobbing and like holding herself that felt 
um, really, really overdone um, to the point of almost laughter. Like it was like, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want, it felt, because it, it was such a, a dramatic thing that just happened to her, you know, like her husband hit her, but to, it, it, like it was so overdone that it was like, okay, get over it. Like it's going to be fine. And I, I, I flinch at the thought of thinking that, but it, I don't think there was really any other, I don't think there, there was much other way to think about it just mm -hmm. because of how it was acted. Yeah, I think really it kind of throw that line between, it was obviously very overdramatic and like melodramatic, of course, but I think it really throw that thin line between like being like hilariously done, you kind of laugh at how bad it is and being just like really over the top. And I think it did that well if that was his intention. And oh, sorry, you can go. Oh, okay. Um, I, I've noticed this, um, you know, there's this theme of the line, don't you see? Or can't you see? Or don't you hear? And every every single time a character said something along that line, I found myself laughing. I was like, oh my goodness, that's so that's so typical. Um, but you know, me and my dislike for melodrama um, that that may be you know a little different for other people. But I found it like borderline hilarious. I mean, there's this word that gets used a lot in '50s film, and it's the word supposed. <laughs> and you just don't hear people say that, I suppose so, or, or I suppose that she's that way. And it's, it's such an odd thing to hear, but it's exactly, I mean, it's very much part of 50s discourse and the film uses it perfectly, like exactly the way you expect. But it does seem, by today's standards, ridiculous. I mean, I think it's tough when you watch this film because I think you could almost lull yourself into believing that you're watching a film from 1958 and totally forget that this film was made in 2002. Like, it's hard to believe that it's made that recently in some ways. Except in, in one other way, though, to bring up the topic that I always bring up, you can tell that it's not because 50s films would never include never. a queer storyline like that. Because I made a joke when we were all, like, watching the movie, and I was like, I was like, one of them's going to have a gay awakening as a joke, and Nicole's like, it's a melodrama. No, they won't. And then he did. <laughs> And it was like five minutes after I said that too. I was like, oh, wait. I, I, I turned to her and I was like, would you, would you like to elaborate on that? <laughs> Why there wouldn't be there? <laughs> but, um, well, isn't that the trick though? I mean, so the film, he basically does a spot on 1950s melodrama, but he does something that he does the thing that he, as a gay male filmmaker, he, he does the thing that he wants. He wishes that the melodramas of the fifties would have done, but couldn't do, which is to have an actual, gay romance in the film depicted on screen effectively yeah. um and i think that that's that's literally the trick of the film like that if you were pitching this film before it ever got made that would have been part of the pitch like we're going to do this thing that no melodrama could have ever done and we're really going to embrace it that's part of the it's part of the script in that sense i think it's really cool and like that he managed to do that and it was a really interesting concept that he went i want to do a 50s movie like something that i would have watched when i was a kid but I want to make it more tailored to audiences such yep. as myself. Yep. And furthermore, and I'm just going to drop this on you and see what you think, but Kathy is the protagonist. Okay. So she's the one we identify with from square one. She's in the first shot of the film. She's in the last shot of the film. She is the protagonist, but she's not the hero. Frank's the hero. That, and that's a really strange thing to say, because I think Frank is in some ways marginalized by the film itself, but he is the hero in the film. He's the only person in the film other than maybe Raymond, he's the only person in the film that knows who he is, that learns who he is over the course of the film and actually grows. I would, I would want, I'm pretty convinced that Kathy does not actually grow over the course of the film or doesn't well, grow be, enough right or grows that. too late. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ava. Yeah. Oh, I just said you might be right about that because her whole character is not very broad. It's very just like, I'm a housewife in the 50s and I happen to like a black man. Yeah. And at like the very end, she's like, maybe we could be together. It just like wasn't very much character development. And he, and he doesn't say this, but like, isn't sort of like the response she gets to that. It's almost like the film's response and not his response, but she's like, maybe we could be together. And the film's like, too late. Like you should have mm -hmm. made, you should have made this decision about like an hour and 15 minutes ago because like now you it's too late you can't and also you can't like decide now that you're going to sign up with the NAACP like you know it, it's just too late like you fuck this up like in in a sense culture has totally screwed it up 
and she's part of culture. And the only person who gets it right in the film is Frank because he breaks the, he completely breaks the trend. And you get the sense that frankly, like, I mean, Frank's probably going to have a, as difficult a life as anybody, but that he's happy for the moment. Like he, he followed his desire and he, and he kind of went through with it. It's pretty profound, I think. I actually, I just wanted to add one more thing about like this gay relationship. It, it was kind of, for a movie that, like you said, kind of um, breaks, like, you know, you would expect a white woman that decided that she liked a black person in most Hollywood films to be like, oh my God, she's so brave. That's incredible of her. I can't believe she did that. But for a movie that, that kind of makes fun of that stereotype, they did include like the weird age gap between like um, like the gay age gap. I don't know what the actual term is, but where one member of the relationship is a lot older than the uh, other. But I was thinking about it and it, it kind of reminds me, it's, it's like that, that anxiety, I think it's an anxiety that's kind of common in melodramas where the woman's like, I'm afraid he's gonna leave me for a younger woman, except flip. So maybe it can get away with it because uh, of that kind of trope where uh, in most melodramas, the women are like uh, are terrified of their husband's uh, secretary, kind of thing. It's a good point. I I don't know what that is called though, by the way. So that there's a sort of stereotype, right? Yeah. So in, in a gay male relationship, that one partner is much older than the other, and we see that culturally and sort of accept it, and it's just played completely for the stereotype. So that this film obeys that stereotype in that way, and I wonder about that a little bit. It's also there in the bar scene, by the way. So you get, like when he walks into the bar, there's guys there who are much, much older than he is. Yeah. Um, and there's something implied in that also. You know, what, um, a shot in the movie that really stood out to me is when they go on vacation and he's in like the room and then you see like the younger man like in the doorway. And for some reason that shot really reminded me of like the shot from the talented Mr. Ripley, because it's also another movie that's like something that wouldn't normally have a gay storyline, but does. But yeah. for some for some reason, that shot reminded me a lot of that movie, yeah. where it's yeah. like he's like pretending to be straight, but then there's like a man standing in the doorway. So I think that's also just like a common trope in like queer queer coded films. And I feel like often um, in, you know, more recent culture, um, there's this idea of the rich older man and then kind of like this dependent double. Um, so I thought, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if like the younger kid knew that, you know, Frank was an older rich man. Um, but I, <laughs> I think the first thing I said when I saw that shot that Ava was describing, I was like, oh, sugar daddy. Um, which I don't know why that's the first thing that came out, out but like that's that's exactly what I thought of like no. you know this male um, double that um, thrives off of this rich older person for emotional economic and sexual stability yeah which I found is, he, is that, he rich though I'm sorry he is, I'd say he's pretty he's upper middle class for okay. sure yeah I just remember at the end like Kathy was worried about her finances because she was saying that like she didn't have much saved and Frank's job was on the line. So I wasn't sure like how rich he actually was, but all right. Yeah, he's it. got the big office at Magnatech. So I have yeah. a feeling he's not CEO level, but he's like a vice president or something like that. Um, so he's probably doing all right. But I think that the scene that kind of refutes the sugar daddy thing is that when you see the unnamed younger man and Frank in the hotel room, um, they don't see, it doesn't seem like a sugar daddy thing anymore. They're just hanging out, you know, like they're kind of right. like, like, it just seems very normal and very natural. And, you know, he's reading the newspaper. So it's almost just like this domestic setting and it doesn't seem special. It just seems like, yep, they're, they're partners now for real. And that's that. Right. All right. Um, so we spoke a little bit about um, the, the LGBTQ side of it. Um, let's see. Uh, we kind of began to talk about tropes in the film or common themes. So um, I think that could kind of be our next topic. Does anyone want to kick us off? Um, 
um, yeah. So, so I guess we could start from like the very, very beginning of the film, like just the um, just the music. Like uh, there was that there was those like sweeping violins as she tucked her husband into bed at night. I think that should have been the first sign that, that he was gay because like, you know, there was, it was a very kind of sterile uh, kiss and then she just put him to bed and, and walked away. Um, but that music, I think, was, that music was, was, yeah, stereotypical of the melodrama. And I think it was meant to dress up this scene more than what it was, because I, I think if you removed it, you would see how, how, like, it was trying to convince us that it was romantic and that these two people were in a healthy relationship. But, um, if you remove that away, it, it, it would, it would seem weirder and it would seem more unnatural yeah or more forced i guess mm. and i feel like not a lot of bedroom scenes that i've seen in just like movies in general have you know that kind of sweeping violin music to it um and i think you know if that was pulled away it would become more of you know it would maybe hold this like sexual tension to it uh which you know this the melodramatic or the melodramatic music was very obviously rejecting mm -hmm. because you know Frank's falling for another man and we don't know it at the time but Kathy's falling for Raymond. Mm -hmm. It the scene itself feels very parental especially because of costumes as well where he's wearing like set pajamas and that made me think that he looked like a little kid and she was like tucking him into bed and like the music and it was like a like a nice clean little bedroom and it for to me it felt like very like parent child rather than husband wife. Yeah. So uh, you know another kind of <clears throat> way I think to look at this is it's it's as though the film is repressing the fact that Frank's gay in the sense that we could know that he's gay from the outset, but the film sort of hides it from us, even though it's obvious in retrospect. And so I'm talking about a few things. So I think the scene in the bedroom is one of these scenes. So they don't have any sexual relationship. And it's clear in that scene when she tucks him in that that's the case, but we don't get it. Like we're willing to sort of like, you know, there's almost this game that's being played. Like when do we figure out that Frank's gay? And so another one is when the cops call and, ha and she has to go pick him up at the thing. And she's got the, the police report in her hand like whatever he was arrested for is on that piece of paper but the film doesn't show us what's on the piece of paper and she throws it in the garbage can so if we had seen that it could have been something like soliciting a prostitute like we have no idea what's on that piece of paper but it could have been something that told us that he was gay and it doesn't so the film's hiding it from us again and then only later does it come out in this shocking way but i, I gotta say that i think there's one character in the film that totally knows what's going on. And I think by the way that Kathy represses it and she kind of knows already they have, to, she has to know for reasons that have to do with the bedroom, et cetera. But there's one character in the film that totally knows that Frank's gay from the outset. And it's Sybil, the housekeeper. Like she, like, like when the call comes in from the police department, Sybil's thinking, I know exactly what this, I know exactly <laughs> what happened here. And she gets it. And only she gets it. And especially important that she's a black character in the film. So the black characters in this film see things clearly. And the white characters in this film are largely repressed and messed up and kind of not living their authentic lives. And I think that that's pretty profound as well. Yeah. Uh, to add on to that, another scene where I think that they were repressing the fact that he was gay was when she had all her friends over and they were all talking about like their sexual relationships with her husband. And she kind of just like sat there and said nothing. Right. And like, as of you, you're willing to like accept that and like move on, but it's like, it's like hinting, but like not actually telling you yet. Totally right. I thought exactly that. So it's like, this woman is having sex a, a moderate amount. This woman's having sex too much. This woman's having sex too having sex too little. And then when it comes to Kathy, she says nothing, and that's because she's not having sex at all. So I think that that's like, it's it's not saying something, but it's saying something without <laughs> saying it. Yeah. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, okay, go ahead. I I was just gonna say I I this is kind of changing the subject a little bit, 
but I, I wanted to mention uh, why I presume the writer was white and then how it was confirmed. Like um, there was that scene where they were at the Modern Art Gallery and he encouraged his little girl, I forget the girl's name, to go outside and play with this group of white boys. And I feel like a black father in the 50s probably knows that those white little boys are not going to be kind to his daughter and so I, I think and obviously in the end they were like cruel to her um, but but I still think a black father would have known better and would have would have been able to predict the the terrible outcome of, of subjecting um, his daughter to that kind of to those kind of people so but I, I that's maybe a nuance that a, a white writer would miss a really good point yeah and in that art scene in particular um and this is tying back to the music piece um when kathy and raymond were standing and talking the music is literally unavoidable it's like right in your face um and it creates almost this tension i feel um between you know kathy and raymond and then um all of the other viewers of the gallery and it kind of it sets up this narrative of, oh, black man bad, you know, get out, um, which I found very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's to, wh- who, who uh, Flora, you were there for the Unteachable Films, right? Nicole, yeah. you were there, yeah. right? Okay, so somebody said there's a scene in Far From Heaven that's like the Bigfoot film. And I was like, what? And then I watched it and it's the scene where Raymond is first spotted walking past the porch and she's like, I think I saw someone out walking around my house. And so that's what yeah. they were referring to. And in some ways, I think that's indicative of the, that, that also kind of tips you off to the fact that this film had a white writer because it's that whole alarm about what's going on around my suburban house. That's a very white sensibility and it's not a black urban sensibility in any way. Like in New York, like you just expect stuff people walking by windows there's just people around but when you're a white person living in the suburbs it's like oh my gosh what was that (laughs) you know someone walked past the window and so yeah only that only makes sense in a white idiom sort of and it was interesting that it was set in hartford you know i was like hartford connecticut what in the world i i've never seen a movie that took place (laughs) and for Connecticut. Um, but I first presumed that, you know, they were in the South um, because they had like, um, you know, black house takers or like care, care keepers. Um, but yeah, Flora's like, oh yeah, there's a Connecticut license plate. I was like, oh, huh, look at that. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it, I th- I'd say two things are going on there. One is that um, we don't think of Hartford at all. So Hartford is just one of those Northeast cities that kind of is just a non-entity for most people. And so that's part of the reason they said it there was to say, you know, we, yeah, to, to make the point that we think about racism existing only in the South, but here's just this generic Northeastern city and it's just as racist as anywhere. But then I also think, I like when I think of Hartford, I think of one thing, which is the insurance industry. So Hartford is like the, the hub of insurance in America. And that means something i'm not sure exactly what it it almost suggests something about like i don't know white people uh sort of like wanting guarantees and wanting to be able to fix any problem and you know so that's exactly what she does in the film like her husband's gay and so they try to have it fixed (laughs) you know insurance exists to fix problems and so some things can't be fixed some things are broken permanently but of course he's not broken So I, I just think generally of Connecticut as like a very white state. Yeah. And I think that they were definitely going for that. When we saw it was Connecticut, we were like, oh, okay. Because seeing like suburban white people in Connecticut is just like so accurate. <laughs> yep. Like even, even today and like, especially in the fifties. Definitely right. Uh, that's, that's the main reason. You're totally right. I don't think it's even that metaphorical. They needed a state that's not North Carolina because this <laughs> doesn't, the, the metaphor loses oomph it loses power if this is set in a even slightly southern state like virginia or maryland um it has to be in a northern state that's super important yep because because the north sanctifies themselves i mean you know even to today i even feel this way i'm like we won the fucking civil war like we're we're not guilty (laughs) well okay and i think that lots of people in the north feel that way it's self-righteousness 
Um, I've this is kind of changing the uh, the topic, but I when we were first watching the movie, I heavily noticed the color scheme: green, orange, uh, purple slash lavender. Um, and it reminded me of home because I'm I'm pretty close to Connecticut, um, and it's like oh that looks so oddly familiar, um, and you know it's this really vivid fall um, northeastern autumn, um, and it reminded me a lot of home. Like there were scenes that looked like places that I would go to. Um, and yeah, I think the, the color scheme in general was the biggest thing that stood out for me. And I don't know if that's just for stylistic choice or if there's like some form of like analysis we can get into, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. That's just something that really stood out. Well, yeah, I thought, go ahead. Yeah, Ethan. Yeah. I was going to say, I thought the colors were very like overdone. Like they're extremely saturated they're very exaggerated. I think in some ways that was kind of to be more dramatic, you know, add drama, some melodrama. I think that was very intentionally done and they intentionally chose three the secondary colors to very strongly emphasize in this film. Is it, so, I mean, it's to my eye, it's like the, the best fall film ever made. Like it's spectacularly well done in terms of like leaves on the trees. And I don't even know how they do it. Cause you know, leaves, like they're not at peak, then they're at peak for two days and then they start falling off the trees. So how did they shoot all this when the leaves were all on the tree? I, I don't even understand it. It must've been perfectly timed and they got a day when the weather's right, right? So like there's no rain, there's no wind, no nothing. And so everything is just so. So then the, the big question in my mind is why set this in fall? Like, why does this have to be an autumn film? I mean, you could say, well, it's to make it colorful but you know, like we watched that all that heaven allows clip and it's set in winter. Like they don't, there's nothing that says a film has to be set in fall. So why fall? Um, if they were going for a more metaphorical approach, it's because it's like changing seasons and changing relationships would go with it. Yeah. They yeah. Like, oh, everything's changing like in seasons. And then like, Oh, my husband is gay. I was going to say, cause the film does end with, um, the film does end on a shot like of blossoms, like in the springtime. That's so I think true. That's, that's a lot. It's a large part of it that, you know, things are changing and that people are growing. Um, and, and like fall, the end of a relationship. Uh, I don't know that that probably has something to do with it, but we're talking about color again. I mean, this, this, <laughs> this is very silly, but, her whole relation, like her whole life falls apart when she finds out her husband is gay. It makes sense that the film is really like bright and colorful. It's like, it's very rainbow. There, there are a ton of different colors in it, um, which I don't know. I think it's kind of interesting. That's a really good point. Yeah. And the short trip to Bermuda too, um, in contrast to Hartford, I noticed a lot of blues and yellows and pinks and reds, um, you know, primary color versus secondary color. Um, which I found very interesting uh, to note because this is when Frank finds um, this this young man that he's fallen in love with. Um, and then as soon as they leave Bermuda, we get back to that green, orange, purple right. color scheme. It's definitely right. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be like a visual contrast. Is it Bermuda or Miami? I thought it was Miami. Oh, <laughs> Miami. They were talking about going Talking to about Bermuda. Bermuda and went to Miami. And then they make the joke about how everything in Miami is pink. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just when you think he's, he's sort of over it, quote unquote, he goes to Miami and then the guy shows up. Yeah, it's wild. <clears throat> what did you think, by the way, of the, you're talking about um, earlier before the uh, call started, a little bit about how, um, you know, homosexuality was represent or how, how homosexuality worked almost in the fifties. Right. So if you couldn't be out and open about this, this is a film that shows you how it works. So these guys go to see a certain movie, right? I think they went to see like a Betty Davis movie and you, you look in and you see the people in the audience and it's all men. And then some of them go to the lobby or go to the balcony and leave together and then go to the bar and that's how the hookups occur. But I, I find that totally fascinating because the film's representing to me something about culture and subculture that I literally did not know. 
like I, I take it to I take that to be a historical fact that that's actually how these hookups would take place. But I guess I've never seen it represented, um, and it's pretty it's pretty great. The whole culture was incredibly secretive. I remember reading something, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but this was like even before the fifties, like maybe eighteen hundreds, where like gay men would wear like a certain flower on their shirt to like yes. let other gay men know that they were gay, and so it's before it was like universally accepted not that it even is now because people are stupid <laughs> um they, they always had like little symbols and like secret like ways of secrecy to go about it and then like after all the hookups and stuff they they'd like have a partner but then they'd be like be like we are friends who live together right that's right. why all the hi history is like they were really good friends these these right. two men lived with each other never never got married just they're just really good friends though yeah, I've heard my mother talking about this kind of thing in her really small town in northern Pennsylvania, uh, growing up in the 40s and 50s, and how it was just sort of known without anybody saying it that a certain, you know, man in the neighborhood was gay or a certain relative was gay. And it was just simply um, unspoken. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like people didn't know it. People knew it, but they repressed it. I mean, that's the right word for it. So they quite literally repressed this knowledge and that's a very strange thing you know that you can know something and pretend like you don't know it at the same time yeah like you'll you'll like know it in your heart but you'll like pretend it's not there and honestly i f i feel like that is the case in a lot of history when people are like oh these two women lived together and never got married because they were so into their friendship and it's like we all know what that means yeah. but like the writer of that book was like choosing to ignore it yes and I think that what's profound that's going on in this film is that all of Hollywood, so Hollywood is very gay, right? So like Rock Hudson is gay. So this is just known. And Hollywood, in Hollywood, it's, it's absolutely known who the gay actors are. But Hollywood also represses it officially. So that all through the 50s and 60s, like you can't show this. And so what this film does is this radical move to sort of do what the film, do what a film of that period couldn't have done in the first place. We've already talked about that, but it's kind of an interesting um, strategy. And in the in the in the film, um, you know, there's this idea of you know public perception of gay people, um, but Frank never really seemed to have a problem with that, like Kathy did in her relationship That's with right. Raymond. Um, so you know, everyone was keeping a close eye on Raymond, but you know, no one even like considered Frank. And I don't know if that's just a matter of um, that older woman seeing it and, you know, spreading the news about the town and not recognizing anything about Frank. But like, I'm kind of surprised that Kathy really kind of kept it on the DL. Didn't she tell Elle? And that was just about it. Right. I think it also from my, my exposure to, to media like this, I, I've seen a few movies that have done this before, but from my understanding, um, or I guess films, my understanding is that like it was embarrassing like you were it was you were ashamed that your like it was somehow a reflection on you as a as a straight woman that that your husband was gay um and so that probably had something to do with it it probably had less to do with oh i want to respect him and more like i can't let anybody know because of me and my pride I, I've got one personal experience with this and it's kind of in a halfway state between the fifties and today. And it's that a friend of mine in junior high, uh, a girl who I hung out with and listened to music with and stuff, her father was gay. And of course, you know, her parents were originally married and then was, her father moved out, moved in with a guy and her mother raised her now raised her, both her parents raised her, but her father was out of the house living with, living in a gay relationship and her mother was her and her mother lived together. And I'll tell you what my response to this was as a kid in 1983, I knew it. I knew what happened. Like I'd heard it through rumors and I knew it to be true. And I never said a word about it. Never said a word to her. I was friends with her and I never mentioned it. And so that's how this, that's how this kind of stuff went. Cause you just sort of don't know, like in that time frame, you don't even know how to bring it up. You don't even know how to broach the subject. Whereas I think today, you know, it's very clear how you would broach this. It doesn't even need to be broached. It's like there, it's out there, you know, people get it. 
Um, so I just think, yeah, that, that form of repression is insidious. It's terrible. It makes, it makes people's lives miserable. It's a very, very bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. That's, that's an interesting personal experience to tie into this. That's something like I never even considered. Yeah. I think it's weird. Cause I almost can't, like, I can see things through your eyes, but not exactly. Because I think when you grow up in a culture that's much more accept, uh, accepting is not even the right word, that where things are just how they are, um, that these sorts of discussions and these little repressions and so forth don't, don't even need to happen and, fla- and in fact don't happen. Now, I don't want to say that that's universally true, though, either, because I think if you went to certain parts of the country or if you're in a very religious area or something like that, then I think these repressions still absolutely do exist. It's a little, I, you know, we're kind of, we are in a bubble for real. Um, on a liberal arts at a liberal arts college in the Northeast, you know, so it is kind of about as open and free and, you know, as it could be. And there's still problems even here. So we don't want to like overwrite those, but boy, this, yeah. this film sure puts it in high relief. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm from um, a rural town in Northeastern Pennsylvania um, that that's been very, very red for a very, very long time. And I think if, if someone's, if someone's dad was gay, that would get some attention. Um, I, I don't think that would that would be anything that we just shrugged off. Although mm, there is, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think for most people, it would it it would garner some looks. Yeah. Yeah, I, and um, so I wanted to kind of uh, maybe kind of call your attention to like a couple other really odd things I think about this film. Um, so one of them is this strange moment in the film when Kathy and Raymond go out for the drive in the country in the truck. And so they're sort of communing with nature and, and there's this weird moment. I still, I can't get over this. To me, this is almost laugh out loud funny where they're standing there at this little farm stand or whatever. And Kathy says, Oh, is that a path? And I just, I find that so weird. Like what? Like, are there people who are just driving around looking for paths? Are there like connoisseurs of paths? And they walk down the path and there's like this semi-circular, like in the middle of the woods, there's this like fountain with these steps. It's just such an odd little, I mean, it's supposed to be this little utopian ideal beat for them. But I just find the whole thing, I find the sentence so straight. Is that a path? Like, who says this? And it's very melodrama. But the upside of that, it's like the happy, utopian, everybody's getting alongside of melodrama, right? <laughs> I, if I were to be totally honest, I, I have like dr- just driven around just to find new little paths and little locations because I live in the middle of nowhere. Um, And I'm sure if you're from Hartford, Connecticut, you might have the same, you know, kind of experience. Um, But like, I I can relate to that. I've definitely found some cool things off some little paths, but I've never like gone about it in a melodramatic way. I'm like, oh, a path, (laughs) let's go explore, you know? Let's go explore this, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Speaking of that scene, I was I was talking about it, um, and and it reminded me just the whole the whole film and how it's shot and and the colors remind me a lot of like PBS docu series shows like the, the, like drama drama um, like drama document like docu dramas that's it sure. um, from like the early two thousands like it was I don't I that were also period pieces I think. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it, I was just struck. It reminded me a lot of sitting in my grandmother's house and watching TV, but yeah. Not even just like the old ones though, because when I saw all, all the nature, my brain automatically said great British baking show. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Where it's like the tent and it's all outside in the woods. I feel like I, that's just a very PBS thing to do. I love yeah. that show by the way. And I, Ava, you've just hit on something that I think is extremely important. Is the great British baking show a melodrama like i think that paper needs to be written i kind of think it is i kind of think, think it is because they'll like zoom in on the the participants and like they'll always like go to someone when something is going wrong and they'll be like is kate's chocolate going to cook <laughs> yep and, and here's another thing and you know in that scene from all that heaven allows that the super famous thing where she accidentally knocks that pitcher off and breaks it 
Yeah. It happens all the time on the Great British <laughs> Baking Show. Like things, like nice cakes get flopped on there. I mean, it's sad. What could be sadder than a cake? Have you ever heard that there's this famous melodramatic pop song called MacArthur Park? And the lyric, the first lyric is, someone left a cake out in the rain. <laughs> Listen to it. It's, you'll cry. Like it's a sad, <laughs> upsetting song. But that's the lyric. And it's very much, it's like a song that's melodrama. And so I think it's possible to have a reality show or a, a cooking show that's melodrama. The other thing I pointed out to another group is if, and we talked about this a little in class, if, the, if melodrama exists today, it's on Bravo, you know? And so I think it's just a very cheap and kind of weakened version of melodrama. It's not the same at all. But um, so we're, we've gone a long time and this is a great conversation and I love talking to you guys, but um, we should end. But I, I want to ask one question though. Did anybody cry? I know Nicole didn't. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely <Nope>. not. <laughs> nope. So I, I didn't either. And I, I saw this at the theater and I don't remember what my response to it was, but like, you know how like you really cry at, in E.T.? I mean, there's certain films that you just can't not cry. Um, this one does not make me cry. It's more academic to me. Like I'm studying it more than I'm involved in it. Um, and it moves me. I'm not saying it doesn't, but if there's one scene that, that almost does it, it's when his, it's when Frank's really upset and then his daughter starts crying. That's upsetting. That's oh, right on that. the edge. You know, you laughed. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> hey, the, I think, honestly, I think you all left. I didn't laugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It reminded me of that one scene from It's a Wonderful Life. When, oh, which scene? Uh, what's the main character's name again? Is his name George? George, yeah. George Bailey. George Bailey. Yeah, when he comes home and he, like, lost the insurance money and, like, his daughter or somebody's like, how do I spell this word? Or, like, can I play you my, like, yeah. I think his daughter's playing the piano and then he's like, will you stop? And then she starts oh, crying. That's right. That's right. totally it. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I thought I, I was like, that's super similar. And I felt like that was almost a reference. These, this film is so adult that the kids don't seem to have any place in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on in this film is very adult. And, right. and the kids almost, to me, almost seem annoying. Like, just yeah. get, come on, just get, quit bugging him. <laughs> like he's having a hard time. Get away. <laughs> it's funny that you mention that because I, sh I wanted to start counting how many times both of them told their kids to just go away and to right. leave them alone. It must have happened at least 15 times. Yeah, like, all, the, all the times. Somebody should like do a... Put together a super cut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like it's like, are you gonna come to my ballet rehearsal? It's like we'll see. And then she, she's like, she's like, guess what I did today? And they're like, go away. <laughs> go to your room. Leave your father alone. Like I don't think they ever have a genuine conversation with their kids. Every single time their kids try to come up to them, they're like, go play. It's We're busy so right funny. now. It's really funny, and I think he's aware of that. I think the film is totally aware of that. Um, you know, people say that uh, film noir never has kids, like there's no film noir that has kids in it. And that's absolutely true. Melodramas always have kids in them, but they're always marginal. So that's an, a different way of having no kids in the film is to just leave them at the outside and don't involve them in the plot. All right, I get it. Go ahead. Say your, yeah. Okay. I just have one really quick question. We do this every show. If you can stay great, if you can't, um, which character would we find at Clark? shoot um i guess i was just thinking like outfit wise the best friend um because she was wearing all those pants and collared <laughs> shirts those are very very clark she, but she'd be like a cool clark professor yeah maybe yeah but with one pro there's one problem and she's it's that she's evil yeah, yeah that's yeah. true i was gonna totally, say except like for she's personality. willing to console her friend kathy about her gay husband but as soon as she finds out yeah. kathy was in a car with a black man she's like see you later you're forget it right. we're, we're yeah. no longer friends so she's that's rotten true. which is too bad but I, I agree looks wise and attitude wise she's she's it gotta yeah. be i don't know who else it would be yeah. frankly i can't even think of anyone else yep good call <laughs> 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 all right this is that i agree Right, this is awesome. And I'm right. gonna pause the recording. We gotta, we gotta say bye to Bart though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Bye, bye to Bart. Bart. Bye Bart. Bye, Bart. <laughs>